Hello, everybody, and welcome to the test review of the Bad Moto GP podcast. We have uh, Jack Gorst with us, who uh, works at Dorna. So uh, you got the you got the okay uh, to do the podcast with me. So apparently, Dorna isn't too mad at me. Thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, what exactly do you do at Dorna? Yeah, just for having me on. Firstly, uh, so I'm a social media editor at Dorna. So my job kind of Uh, consists of just running the main social media channels. Um, one of my big things is that I do all the live tweet coverage during the weekend. So any of the tweets you see from the races, free practices, qualifying uh, on our Twitter over the weekend, that will be me uh, and one of her as well. So my whole job is the social media stuff. Do you actually decide what gets posted or do you have like guidelines on what you need to post? We, yeah, of course we have guidelines, like we have a general tone of voice and kind of things we can and can't say. Um, nothing too restrictive, like generally it's it's very much just trusted to me to take it upon myself and say uh, what I see fit. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, like I'm a fan of MotoGP, so all I'm doing is reacting as a fan. I'm not reacting as, you know, the official MotoGP voice, although I am slightly. It's It's mainly like what I find interesting and what I feel should be told in the race and stuff like that because and um, i believe it was in austria there was a lot of backlash because uh there was like an instagram or twitter post where john mir's high side was called like superb i don't know if you did it um but uh yeah there was a lot of backlash so i'm just curious on if it's just you deciding hey i need to pull this uh, crash up or if you have um if you have guidelines, because there were a lot of people who said that uh, this shouldn't be something uh, which should be celebrated in a way if a rider has a hard crash. And in my personal opinion, before I let you answer is that I don't necessarily mind because when you want to put out stuff on social media, you want to do, first of all, um, report on what's happening. And this is obviously what happened. And uh, additionally, you want to post stuff that get the most traction. So I guess this is always something which gets uh, a lot of attention along with all the overtakes, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's of course, there's the element of, uh, you know, something that looks quite spectacular, like a big crash is always going to get traction, but that's not, like, that's never the, the main reason why we post. The, the first big reason is that if it's a crucial piece of telling a rider's story throughout the year, like Joanne's crash, Obviously, he was injured from that and put him out for quite a while. You know, we, we have to show that crash. We have to inform that crash to people. It's not that we, you know, want to put the crash out there to get loads and loads of clicks and all that sort of stuff. Of course, naturally, crashes do get clicks because it looks, you know, crazy. And people comment, you know, asking how they are and all this sort of stuff. But first and foremost, if anything happens, like in the live, like say, if I'm watching a session and I'm covering you know, the session through live tweets, the first thing is we always wait to see that the rider is okay. Like if they've got up and walked off before we then go on and either post a screenshot of the crash or the clip, you know, if it's a, a small crash. Um, but yeah, the main motivation for that is that MotoGP as a sport is always going to have crashes and injuries and we can't sanitize that out of the sport. So we have to do it in a responsible way. Of course, obviously that copy did get a bit of backlash in that I'll completely own up to it and say that that was my mistake. Um, in the one, I think in my five years at Dorna, it's the one time that I messed up on the judgment of a copy, you know? So um, my mistake on that one, it was meant to be a small little kind of lighthearted joke because Joanne actually had kind of, you know, hinted and chuckled about the crash patiently beforehand, you know, saying that he was all okay and no problems, even though obviously he was a little bit injured. Um, but yeah. The main reason to show that crash is purely to tell a reason. Like he has loads of fans out there and they want to know what's happened to him. So, yeah, and I feel like this is not necessarily a criticism from the rider itself. It's more like a criticism of people who maybe react sensitive to something like this, where a rider itself would uh, maybe laugh about the crash. I don't know how Jean reacted about it, but. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, they know uh, what they're doing. And I feel like they're a little, have a different relationship to those crashes than normal people would have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a rider, I don't know how many crashes they have in their career, but it's a lot, you know, and they have 
a lot of big crashes as well, not just a small little kind of front end low sides that we see, but also, as you say, like big high sides like that. And yeah, it is a bit weird that they kind of get up from them and think, ah, and they're used to it, you know. Um, but yeah, in that situation, uh, obviously it got a bit of backlash, but the whole point of showing that crash and all the crashes that we show throughout the season is to tell the story. I mean, it is what it is. I guess you learn only from it. And at the end of the day, nobody exactly. except me maybe remembers it anyway. So, <laughs> um, the main reason I asked you, uh, I asked you to do this podcast was, uh, was I saw you on the After the Flag in uh, Malaysia. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, this was your first time on After the Flag because uh, last season it was just Louis Sadabai and Simon Crafer. So is it correct that it was your first time in front of the camera? Uh, not my first time, actually. I did the very small segment on After the Flag. When was it? It was in Haref. I think it was at the end of 2021. Um, very small segment. But yeah, I mean, like, unless you were watching, you know, Hawkeye every second, you wouldn't have seen me. Um, but no, not my first time on camera. I do the MotoGP eSport stuff as well. Um, so I've done a little bit of camera work, but yeah, mainly that was my first kind of proper appearance on After the Flag there in Sepang, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was it was good. You enjoyed it? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I like to just talk about my HGP and particularly the bikes. Like I'm a big tech head, basically. I love all the the new parts and kind of finding out, you know, how the bikes are working, which riders kind of you know feel good for the bike and which don't. So you know, that's like the tests are kind of where I coming to my own most people don't like the tests but i like the tests yeah so you're the perfect the perfect guest to discuss the whole test so let's jump right into it because uh, i would like to discuss basically every manufacturer and let's start with the reigning world champions ducati they sure. brought the uh, gp23 to the test and um just a little bit of a background story in 2022, Tech used the 21 engine to uh, to ride because he wasn't feeling confident with the 22 engine. However, Jorge Martin and Juan Zarco um, rode the 22 engine. So they had like the real GP22 22, and, um, and Peko had like a hybrid thing. So mm -hmm. I'm uh, pretty interested on how the 23 engine developed so maybe please explain what was the problem with the 22 engine and what different characteristics did it uh, have from uh, the 21 engine and then talk a little bit about uh, what's different about the 23 engine because i've heard it goes a little bit more into the direct into the direction of the 21 engine from a characteristics standpoint yeah sure i mean for the excuse me for the the 22 engine basically the Catty made a small change, like they didn't do anything drastic. They didn't change like the firing order or anything in the engine. It was just small internal changes. Um, but what they found was um, it had a lot more torque down low, I think. I think that was the general consensus anyway, or at least it changed the kind of power delivery down low. Um, and what they were struggling with really was kind of rolling the throttle on mid corner uh, and keeping the rear wheel, you know, going constant rather than stepping out and spinning. Um, so that was the big problem. It was like that initial hit was kind of too strong. Uh, and they liked the rest of the engine, kind of the characteristics of it. You know, it had like kind of good power apparently. Well, always as, as every year with the Catty, it had good power, but there was some benefits with the 22 over the 21. It wasn't like it was entirely, you know, just throw it in the bin and start again. Um, so Peko, Peko is very particular rider and obviously out of all the guys on there, it was kind of not much of a surprise that he was the one that found it kind of too big of a, a change. And so they went back to this kind of halfway house 2021, 2022 engine spec, which I presume had a little bit of a softer throttle uh, hit initially. Um, he seemed to like it. Uh, I don't know if he was 100% happy with it, but obviously he was pretty happy with it because he won the title with it in the end. Um, but for 2023, from what we know it sounds like that the 2023 engine is based more on the 2021 engine than the 22 engine it was interesting with jorge martin because he said that from the 22 engine to the 23 engine he was like yeah definitely better like big improvement all this sort of stuff but peco 
an Enea that were on similar engines, not quite the same, because Enea was on the full 21 and Peko was on that kind of 21.5. They said to the 23, it was maybe not quite as big a step as what Martin was feeling. So it seems to be really that the biggest thing was for the 23 engine, they're trying to, over the 21, like find a little bit more torque down low um, and really make it a little bit smoother, but without making it too overpowering so they have all the rear grip issues and kind of when they're in the middle of the corner and coming out of the corner. Um, So yeah, it seems to be mainly that, like, you know, Pekka last year just struggled with when he tested the 22 engine that it was just too strong at the bottom. So it's not the linear power development uh, you want in an engine. It's more like uh, it goes strong at the at the bottom in low, lower RPMs and then evens out a little bit more. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to say. I'm sure it was still pretty linear, of course, but maybe it was just that fraction too strong down the bottom. Instead of there being like a slight dip in the power curve at the bottom, they kind of just amped it up a bit too much and it was just slightly too strong there. Um, so yeah, it seems that Anyway, the 23 engine based a lot more around the 21 engine and a little bit smoother um, and softer than the, the 22 was. And I think Bastianini even said that he felt like with the 23 engine, he could ride the bike smoother uh, than he could with the 21. So it seems to be working okay. And uh, Peko said that he experienced or said that uh, Ducati found more power which is like bad news for everybody else because <laughs> everybody couldn't overtake the Ducatis anyway. So um, they even found more power uh, and more top speed with the new engine that compared to the 21 slash 22 bike. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't surprise me if they have. I'm, I'm sure they've have, you know, obviously Ducati with the desmodromic valve setup and all that sort of stuff. They they know how to make some big horsepower. Like, with, I think it's rumored that it's, you know, way over 300 horsepower now or something like that. So um, it's a pretty powerful beast. Um, but the biggest thing, actually, that sounds like the biggest change with the new engine is that it's a lot better with uh, engine braking and being able to actually stop it. So obviously with that, newfound horsepower now they've suddenly found that actually the new engine is also helping them to stop quicker too so um yeah it doesn't spell good news for the other guys paul espagaro said that the honda wasn't meant to be ridden with the rear brake and that he found with the ktm it's more his style because he has to uh, break a little bit more with the rear brake and it suits him better and Going back to Ducati with the stronger engine brake, better engine brake. And um, how is it beneficial for a rider to have? Uh, let's let's pretend we are stupid. We don't know anything uh, about about uh, riding a motorcycle. So please, uh, first, what's the difference between just breaking the rear with the engine brake and breaking the rear with the with the um, with the rear brake with your foot? So. Let's start off this way. Yeah, I'd say like the Billy basics at that, are like if you're engine braking, it's completely natural. So say you're full gas on the throttle and as soon as you close the throttle, um, you know, as long as you don't have the clutch in, you'll obviously feel the bike kind of pull back into itself and you'll be forced forward a little bit because naturally the engine obviously has um, friction, so it's going to slow down eventually. So that's like your kind of natural engine braking and mechanics, you'll always hear them, <clears throat> say that you know the riders play with the engine brake mapping uh, during the race you can change the kind of characteristic of the engine brake you know its strength how strong and in which gears you know you want as much engine braking or as little as possible <clears throat> so it's something excuse me <clears throat> it's something that's very tunable and that is basically just the natural braking of the engine itself in terms of with the rear brake, that is literally you forcing the bike to stop by obviously the caliper squeezing on the rear disc and it's slowing the wheel down itself. Um, so when you say about Paul saying that the Honda wasn't made to brake, to use the rear brake, sorry, um, it's a tricky one to analyze because we don't really know exactly how the Honda feels because none of us are GP riders, but uh, we know that Honda struggled with a little bit of rear traction, like everywhere basically into the corner in the middle of the corner and out of the corner as well so maybe that kind of refers to that you can't use the rear brake too much when going into the corner 
because if you don't have so much traction on the rear, then it maybe just cause the rear to lock up instead of actually biting into the tarmac and, and slowing down. So what benefit does the 23 engine provide to a rider um, who goes into a corner where the engine brake obviously is most uh, used? Um, the benefit, it, well, it's, it's not a thing of like, if you have more engine braking, then you're going to stop quicker. Because if you have more engine braking, you know, it can get to a point where it's too much and you lock the rear wheel and it starts to slide and, you know, you have to let off the brake to gather it all under control again. But uh, Pekka mentioned that the inertia of the engine, so the actual like rotating mass of the engine is slightly different. Um, and maybe with that inertia, that the way that the engine slows down, it causes the, the bike to have better characteristics on the brakes and maybe, you know, brake in a more controlled manner and they feel like they can brake harder. And then that's them, you know, getting the general gist that, you know, they feel the engine helps them to brake better. Or maybe it is just the actual engine itself that has a better characteristic as it slows down and it causes them to stop better. So basically it provides more stability while braking. Yeah, it might be the thing. It's either more stability or more actual braking force that's, you know, manageable and controlled. Uh, it was funny, as you said, that you don't necessarily always want more engine brakes because I remember um, on my 125, when I was 16 years old, I drove to school <laughs> and uh, I was half asleep and going into a roundabout. And I thought I was going down into second gear, but um, I went down into first gear. <laughs> we <laughs> uh, fortunately, I didn't crash, but uh, I was awake then. So it's better than every coffee you can have. But, uh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about uh, there, because uh, when, when the rear is coming, when you have too much engine brake, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, difficult because the bike isn't as linear as it should be when you're braking, especially when you're on the street braking into a roundabout and yeah. Yeah. So, um, to the GP 23, Davide Tadozzi said in an interview that the GP 23 still has a quote unquote, uh, main weakness. So could you enlighten us on what this main weakness is? Do you know it? Um, I don't know specifically because I'm not an Italian Ducati engineer, but I can give it a good guess. Um, I mean, to be fair, Pecco and, uh, and Inea kind of gave it away, well, at least what we think might be the main weakness or what they just want the media to believe is the main weakness. Um, it seems like it's still to do with the throttle uh, connection and also power delivery. Um, they said that they were lacking some kind of uh, not... Well, yeah, a little bit of feeling in that area. So it's probably when the bike is all the way over on its side uh, and they have to start very smoothly and slowly tapping in the power. Um, and that comes back to the whole problem around the GP22 engine because it made the power to hit too strong when they just run the throttle on. And so that whole throttle connection and power delivery kind of caused havoc with rear grip at the back. And I think Marini was the one that really struggled with it at the start of the year. Um, he was having lots of like small little crashes where the rear would just slide out from underneath him and low side. Um, so it seems to be that it's still that kind of area, their, their throttle connection and actually using that power in a very smooth way to roll on through the corner uh, and exit the corner. They're not so bad coming out of the corner because the Ducati has really good um, rear traction and rear grip coming out the corner, but it's in. It seems like it's in that middle part of the corner where they're they're really having to be very precise with the throttle. Do you think that in the during the twenty two season where Inea Bastianini was on the GP twenty one, and Jorge Martin was on the GP twenty two, that the characteristic of the GP twenty two, which apparently wasn't as good as the engine characteristics of the GP twenty one maybe costed uh, Martin a little bit of performance in a way where he didn't um, where he didn't show his full potential as a rider and therefore lost out to Enea and for the factories. Um, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, uh, I hadn't really put too much thought to it, but, you know, yeah, it's definitely possible, at least in the, the start of the year for sure, because as you saw at the start of last year, all the... Ducati guys were struggling. Um, it took them 
you know, three, four races to get up to speed. I think only Zarko was really the one that actually at the start of the year had some good results. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely possible. But I think more so than anything else, I think the thing that cost Martin last year was actually just him worrying about this battle with Asunini for the factory seat. Like he, he said about it himself, you know, that it was on his mind and he was thinking too much about that rather than just focusing on the racing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely possible that kind of the issues with the GP22 engine had a, had an effect, yeah. And you touched already on Luca Marini. He was first in the test in Valencia. He was first in the test in Malaysia. And uh, I feel like what they did with Marini was genius because he was on the GP22 last year. Then he figured it out over the season and now he's on the same bike again with all the data, everything is the same. So he can really develop as a rider and doesn't have to adapt to a new bike, even though it's just a small change maybe, but it's yeah. still exactly the same bike. So I feel like Marini could be a contender for victories a little bit like Inia Bastianini was, so a dark horse in a way. Mm -hmm. So what are your um, thoughts on Marini? coming out of the test. Yeah, I mean, he did a great job at the tests. I really like Luke. He's great. Um, to interview, he's really good and all that sort of stuff. And he actually tells you a lot of the time, you know, like how he's going on the bike rather than giving you a, a very PR answer. Uh, in terms of, you know, if he's going to be like Bassinini last year, it kind of pains me to say it, but I don't think he'll be on that level, you know, uh, and certainly not throughout the whole year at least as well. I do expect Luca to get some podiums next year. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's harsh to say, but I think that's as good as we'll see Luca do next year. I don't really see him winning a race. I mean, anything can happen, obviously. Uh, but yeah, I think he's going to struggle, particularly as they start to develop the GP23 package, you know, five, six races into the season, and we'll see them kind of elevate that level. But As I say, I mean, Luca at the end of last year surprised a lot of people, I think, you know, with the amount of top sixes he's had. Um, I think he, what was it, in like the second half of the season, he only finished outside the top six once or twice or something like that. So he's certainly doing a very good job at the minute. Um, and yeah, I think he'll be on the podium. And if he's not on the podium, I think it's a, a bit of a disappointment. But I don't see him doing a Bassinini and coming out and winning one of the first few races, to be honest. Let's see. I have a, a little bit of a of a guess because his development is superb. He, I don't know if it's still uh, accurate, but I believe he finished every MotoGP race because uh, they crashed. I think he in, crashed out of one or something, did he? Was in Thailand, but he got back on the bike. I believe. I, I'm not. Uh, sure. Yes, I'm not I think incorrect, sure, but. He crashed, yeah, but officially, I believe he finished every race. Yeah. And, um, but still, this is a very, very good characteristic uh, to have, to not crash. And uh, as I pointed out, that he knows everything about the bike. He has all the data. He did the sprint um, simulation in Malaysia. So I, I have a feeling about him, maybe not winning actual GP, but maybe winning a sprint race. Or yeah. You could see that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, a sprint race is obviously another different kettle of fish it's going to be interesting to see how they go actually um but there's no reason why luca couldn't challenge for the win in the sprint yeah i mean in a main gp i think he'll have his work cut out for him getting a win there um i think in a race weekend scenario like again just because he's a bigger guy he's going to suffer a little bit more with tire life and stuff like that um but no in a sprint i mean we know that he's quick now like he's qualified on the front couple of rows a few times in the last in the tail half of last season so he's got that one lap speed and you know in a sprint when he can put together laps like he did in sepang in his sprint simulation there's no reason why he can't challenge for the win in those after the tests do you think that enea and peko are the main two uh two contenders for the championship yeah probably at the minute they look like it um It's going to be interesting to see what happens with those two because it's all kind of sunshine and rainbows at the minute. But um, as they actually start to roll on and, you know, battle for a title and race wins, it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Um, it's a very interesting dynamic because obviously Enea is like this almost kind of 
Um, he's like a kind of baby-faced killer, if you know what I mean. Like, he's a very nice guy and very pleasant, but then as soon as the helmet goes on, he doesn't care. Like, he just wants to win. Um, so, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. I, It's kind of interesting because, obviously, there is a number one in that garage, but I think everyone's having a tough time at the minute of actually picking who could be number one at the end of the year. Maybe we will get a wall again. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I mean, that would be drama. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> and... Uh... During the end of last year, where Peko was really uh, competing for the for the title, it felt like Enea was the Ducati who cared uh, the fewest. I don't know how to say it, the least. least. Yeah, yeah. Um, who cared the least about Peko's uh, championship and just wanted to win. So I thought this might be a good uh, a good pairing for twenty three for us fans. Yeah, I mean it should be great. Um, you know, it's it's obviously clear at the minute we don't have too many kind of bitter rivals you know obviously in the past we've seen a lot of bitter rivalries Rossi and Marquez we won't go too much into that but um yeah there's there's not many bitter rivals at the minute in MotoGP and it would be nice to see I don't want to see them have a big rivalry like a you know a nasty rivalry I don't want to see that but I just want to see them you know kind of not get on too well if you know what I mean just have yeah. that little bit of needle between them to see but I mean you say about that Enea was the Ducati rider that cared the least. I think you're wrong. I think that was Martin. So, but Martin wasn't in a position where he really could have uh, could have impacted Peko's yeah. championship. You know. Yeah, correct. But still, like, I mean, at the end of the year, Martin seemed very like, I don't care at all. I just want to go out and prove a point and win. Yeah. I mean, you could have also said uh, theoretically, uh, Fabio Di Antonio cared the least. <laughs> But it wouldn't matter, you know? Yeah. Like um, all the Ducatis who helped maybe pack a little bit on track, it felt like that Inea was the one who cared uh, the least because he was actually in a situation where he costed Peko five points in Aragon or where he was battling with him in Malaysia and in, uh, in Misano. And the thing in Malaysia still, uh, I feel like he could have gone for a move but it wasn't like a move where he was as confident as you can be because he didn't want to be the guy who wipes out Peko and loses in the title you know yeah I mean it's, it's tricky because there was a lot of topic about particularly that Malaysia race um, afterwards uh, and I think there's kind of a big difference between letting someone win and being cautious trying to overtake the man that leads a championship you know um, and I really think it was the second part of it he didn't roll over at all like he was going for it he wanted to win that race and if he had lined up what he thought was a pass that he could do he would have done it um so yeah it's it's very interesting but i don't know this this year is going to be as it goes down the line it, it's going to be crazy to see what actually happens because i don't think Peko, even though he's obviously on this wave of confidence and the number one on the bike now i don't think he's going to be sitting too comfortably after uh, half the season, to be honest. No. And the other championship contender, obviously, is Fabio. Yeah. And Yamaha made apparently some big steps with the engine. Yeah. They upped the top speed. Unfortunately for them, Ducati upped the top speed <laughs> as well. Yeah. But it seemed like they figured something out with the bike. They brought new aero. They brought, I believe, the new chassis as well. <clears throat> or is it the, that the new chassis is coming in Portimao? I can't remember. There was a, a chassis there in Sepang, yeah. Um, it's very hard to tell with Yamaha what's a new chassis because they look pretty much identical, but there's some small, slight differences, yes. Um, but to be honest, I mean, Fabio, uh, I mean, I asked him about whether he liked the new chassis or not, and he said it didn't help him at all. So um, unless there's a new chassis again in, in Portimao, then it seems that he's still going to have the same chassis problems at least uh, as last year but as you say with the engine they've definitely made progress which is good you know like if Fabio was able to to fight and challenge that hard last year despite all the problems then you would think that with a better engine he'll be slightly better but then there was also some kind of mutterings and rumors that you know the new engine was making the bike a little bit harder to ride or or whatever so um, we'll see how it goes but at the minute it's kind of 
there's it almost seems like one step forward and and one step back for Yamaha. The engine obviously is a very easy problem to spot because when you have a Ducati flying by on every straight, you could see, hey, the engine is a problem. But you <clears> talk <throat> about some chassis problems. What exactly do you mean by that? Um, I think the biggest thing is that Fabio last year always struggled with the front end. With the front end, uh, just felt like he was on the limit all the time. Um, it's it's difficult because he's complained so much of like so many different things, and this is something that's kind of happened as well uh, with Yamaha and come from various Yamaha riders in the last few years. I think the best one was Crutchlow when he first got on the Yamaha and started testing it. He said that like the bike has so much torque that when they have grip, they have grip and it's great, like in terms of at the back with the rear wheel. But when the track doesn't have grip, they just have nothing. So it's like you've already kind of got this bike that either feels like a dream or doesn't, and you're never really too sure how it's going to feel. And then Fabio's having to push so hard that he's on the limit everywhere on the front end. Um, and you, as you know, if he's pushing everywhere with the front end, it's going to heat the front tire up more than he needs to. It's going to inflate the pressure more than he needs to. And then he runs that line of being so close to the point where the tire becomes too hot and too inflated that he just can't do anything and has to drop back. So, yeah, it's interesting. It doesn't seem like that problem's been solved in terms of being able to take some margin off how hard he has to ride and kind of ride within the bike's comfort zone. I mean, to be honest, Fabio was on the limit and above the limit for the whole season. Yeah. And uh, I feel like he is the still the best rider in this championship, even though he lost out to Peko because Peko has the better bike. But from a riding perspective, I feel like Fabio is the better one. And he managed to walk this thin line between uh, what's the limit of the bike and not stepping over it, maybe until Assen perfectly and then he started a little bit to to crumble in a way even though it sounds unfair to to say he crumbled mm. because he was in a situation where he uh, he was meant to lose you know and uh, he also said that the Yamaha isn't a bike anymore which is smooth he has to ride it really aggressively and uh, I feel like this is a struggle that Frankie has because he w was successful on the old Yamaha, which was more like the 2019 Yamaha he rode in 2020, where he had his best season. Yeah. So, what's the what's the issue with the uh, with the characteristics of the Yamaha? How it changed, and what's your impression on the new bike? Um, well, it's, it's difficult to know really because they they're always quite tight lipped about how it's how it's changed. Um. We do know that Frankie has actually maybe made a little bit of a step forward with the new bike. Um, but I think that's more of a change within Frankie himself rather than the new bike working better. Uh, Frankie said that like he started to ride it more aggressively and his understanding how to ride it more aggressively. Um, and it seems like he made, you know, an a, a okay step there in the Sepang test. Obviously, he wasn't far behind Fabio, but I think as you pointed out in one of your memes, they weren't exactly far up the... Uh, far up the order either so it's kind of a six of one and half a dozen of the other um yeah specifically to do with the bike it's hard to know what's changed uh in terms of characteristics largely you know it's it's still a yamaha m1 it's it's good points and it's bad points are still going to be exactly the same we know that with a new engine it's probably made the bike a little bit more aggressive coming out the corner as they get on the throttle um but then also they're trying to work on you know, increasing rear grip and, and making the front end better. Yeah, I, to be honest, I can't tell you what's changed, you know. Um, they're always so tight-lipped on what the developments are and how the bike feels now compared to, to before. Um, we know that Fabio, when he was testing some of the aero, uh, is still, like, undecided on it, basically. He doesn't know which one he wants to go for obviously you would think that if he has more power he would go for the bigger aero which they had at the test um but it seems that he's still not decided on that so it tells me that you know even with kind of the changes with the engine and stuff like that the bike still largely feels the same as it did before i feel like frankie is in a 
make or break season in a super unfortunate situation because let's pretend he really closed the gap to Fabio but the Yamaha still isn't anywhere near the Ducatis de Aprilias and he's getting top 10 finishes but no victories no podiums uh, the occasional top five maybe he's still not in a position where it it looks like he should be the rider for the for the future even though it's not his fault because I feel like the 23 season he really has to prove a point to keep his seat and if the Yamaha isn't necessarily competitive he's again in a situation where he is uh, losing either way you know a little bit like Fabio was last year, but different, you know? Yeah, I, I agree with the point, you know. It's a, it's a kind of lose-lose situation. It doesn't matter if he goes better. If he's not close to Fabio or beating him at least somewhat regularly, then he's, he's going to look bad, essentially. Uh, and as we know of Frankie, he's not a bad rider. It's just that, you know, unfortunately, the minute he's riding a bike that for some reason isn't gelling with him. Although there was some positive kind of feeling around Frankie actually at Sepang Test, whether it's just because he's had a winter off and he feels rejuvenated and he's got his energy back or not. But the biggest thing was he said he was really, really happy about Yamaha's kind of mentality change. Um, you know, like lots of new items in the box and different philosophies and ideas. So I think if they can keep that positivity with Frankie and like kind of keep him energized, then hopefully he kind of is able to sort himself out. Um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting situation whether Frankie, you know, can actually revive himself because, as you say, it's make or break. If he doesn't, then to be honest, he's out at the end of the year. And from where he is, I don't see him being picked up by anyone else either. So it's a yeah, it's a, it's a big year for Frankie. I hope he does manage to figure it out because he's an incredible rider when he's actually going well. Um, and plus for Yamaha, like they need two riders because they've only got two bikes on the grid now. They have to have two riders performing well, and um, not just for you know Frankie's sake or for the team making them look good, but also just to develop that bike. You know, we say about Ducati with eight bikes on the grid, and all eight of those riders are going fast and riding the bike well. Um, if Yamaha only have a quarter of the potential data and then still have one of their riders not doing the same things as, as Fabio, then it's, yeah, it's not going to go well for them. And Frankie is such a good rider, which bumps me out the most. He was one engine blob away from winning the 2020 World Championship. Yeah. And people seem to forget how dominant he was in Moto2. He was playing games with everybody. And I feel like his MotoGP career was a bit unfortunate because he went to Honda and the Honda is obviously not a very rookie friendly bike, especially back then. And now it's just not a rider friendly bike, I guess. <laughs> and, um, then he went to Yamaha where things got better, but he got a little bit overshadowed by Fabio. And in 2020, he had such an incredible season and didn't, really got what he deserved because Fabio was getting the um, getting the factory seat and he proved Yamaha right at the end with winning the title but still uh, Frankie got the got not uh, not the latest uh, spec bike and then when the whole Maverick Vinales situation was um, I would have wished a little bit more support from Yamaha towards Frankie where there was this gap in uh, where Nobody exactly knew what they were going to do with the factory seat. And I feel, felt like, hey, when Maverick is out right now, which he was, then the next step should be, hey, let's put Frankie on the bike, at least for the rest of the season. And I felt like they did him a little bit dirty and with the bike now, and he's not particularly happy. I feel like with the with the 21 or 22 bike and I, I feel a little bit sorry for him because he's such a good rider with so much potential, but there were so many things out of his control where I really hope that he does well in 23 first. And second, even if Yamaha doesn't uh, keep him for 24, that he finds uh, a good competitive bike and uh, is able to to show everybody how good of a rider he actually is. Maybe Valentino will pick him up. I 
I would have put uh, I would put Frankie uh, into Prama alongside Pedro mm-hmm. for 24. <laughs> uh, but yeah, maybe that's uh, that's uh, a legit possibility. But uh, yeah, without speculating about the 24 season, I really hope that uh, Frankie shows everybody what he's capable of in 23 and gets a competitive seat wherever it is in 24. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It would be a shame if a rider of Franco Morbidelli's level is, you know, kicked out of MotoGP purely because he's had a bit of a bad run and no one really wants to take him up, even though they know that deep down in there, there is still the same rider that, as you say, almost won the world title in 2020. Interesting, actually, about Pramac. I hadn't thought of that situation for, for 24. I kind of like that. That would be cool. But... Yeah, but I don't see a reason why Ducati would sack Juan Zacro. Because yeah. he's doing a lot of testing work, I've heard, during the race weekends, which is super valuable for them. Yeah. And with Jorge Martin, of course, uh, he hinted on going to Yamaha. Maybe he stays at Ducati. I don't know what's going on there. But, um, yeah, I feel like this or maybe Valentino, when Bezeki moves maybe to Prama, who knows, um, would be a good move for him. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously the kind of rumors about well, Yamaha are going to want to come back with a satellite team at some point as well. And it just makes sense if they did that with Valentino's team. So it's, you know, whether that happens in 24, I doubt it because I think if it was, we've maybe already heard some, some kind of concrete rumors by now, but um, you never know in the future. It would be cool if, if it did happen. Would it make sense for Valentino to go from Ducati to Yamaha? Only if the bike's good enough. Okay. I mean, like, you can't go from having the best bike on the grid to, oh, yeah, we'll change the Yamaha just because I, you know, want some more titles with these guys. That's yeah. not a good enough reason. Um, so, yeah, that's the other thing. Hopefully the bike can be good enough. But uh, I think you'll see at the Portimao test what Fabio thinks because we know that he kind of says what he wants. So it'll be interesting. He has earned the right to do so. So He has, yeah. He, he has really enjoyed. And a funny Frankie story. Um, as we all know, my account is bad MotoGP memes too, because the first one got banned after the first Misano Grand Prix in 2021. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then I had a backup account and I lost all my followers, was like a couple hundred, maybe uh, was a thousand uh, again. But after the second Misano Grand Prix, Frankie put a meme of mine into his story and I got so many followers uh ah, yeah this was like an increase of uh 50 or whatever so i'm really thankful for that because <laughs> i was in a situation where all my um yeah air quotes work <laughs> as art by uh, instagram and then uh he kind of helped me out i don't know if he uh, even knows about it but yeah i'm really thankful for for that well, it, it did make me laugh the other day because, as I said about that, uh, the meme with the top speeds, and it was like when, oh no, when Frankie was half a tenth or whatever he was behind Fabio, but then they were 18th and 20th. I saw that Frankie liked that meme actually, yeah. and that made yeah. me laugh. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, he likes occasionally uh, my memes about him. I had one where uh, Valentino Rossi's daughter was born, and it was on the weekend where the Qatar GP uh, was. And I had, I made a tweet. Uh, Whereas, like, uh, the doctor was like, yeah, your baby is um, is coming. And Valentino uh, was like, Psh, Frankie has a red sector. And he uh, <laughs> put it and put it onto Instagram as well. And he liked that as well. So Frankie is a very, very cool dude. I love him. He is. Yeah, he's very cool. He was quite funny in the in the broadcasters set in Sepang, uh, giving typical, like, Frankie interviews with short kind of answers to keep you on your toes. He's funny. I like him a lot. Yeah. And do you think Fabio is a threat for the Ducatis? We talked about Inia and Peko for the championship. Do you feel like Frank, uh, not Frankie, Fabio <laughs> is up there uh, and ready to battle them? Or is it is it still that he's maybe one or two steps behind? I, I do think they're a step behind, but um, I'm sure you heard about this thing with Yamaha where for some unknown reason they the when they put new tires in they can't find the extra lap time uh if they can figure that out he'll be fine whether he's you know on the limit with the bike or not i'm sure that he'll he'll challenge them again 
Um, maybe he'll have a kind of carbon copy season as last year where he's kind of always struggling to to fight with them. But hopefully if they can actually qualify and he qualifies on those front two rows regularly, then there's no problem uh, why he wouldn't be able to fight with them. We know he's aggressive in the early laps and if he can get on that front row, then certainly sprint races are going to be his domain. Um, and the longer race, it's just all about whether he can fight them off or not. Yeah, my unedu and my uneducated guess with the whole uh, qualifying pace is that they simply don't understand the new bike fully and how to set it up properly for one lap. That's my guess, and I feel like they will figure it out. But uh, I've seen a funny, uh, a funny stat that Fabio is getting slower each Zipang test from 2019 to 2021 to or 20. Uh, 22 to 2023, it was oh, like yeah. times, and uh, he actually got slower. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? Um, Fabio, over the last uh, three Zipang tests, yeah, he uh, got slower with the one lap uh, pace. Uh, he had his fastest, uh, I believe. I didn't fact check it; could be wrong, could be uh, could be uh, the wrong lap times. But uh, I saw something where he was in 2019, I believe, uh, mm. fastest, and then like uh, 22, he got slower, and 23, he's again slower than he was in 22 and in 2019. So yeah, I don't know, but I think they will figure it out uh, over time as they understand the bike more. And qualifying is really important with the sprint races now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I hope that the uh the slower trend is not the case, but uh, I mean, as we say, testing is not everything. You know, if testing with everything, then Maverick Vinales would be uh, a five-time world champion by now, but uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think you're right that, like, you know, with the new engine and stuff, that maybe there's just some setup stuff there that they need to figure out. Um, so hopefully they can do that. But the trouble is, like, you know, we go to Portimao for the test in the first race, and Portimao is such a particular track. Like, it's one of these ones... Obviously, like it's a it's a very setup heavy track rather than necessarily which bike has more performance than others. Um, so hopefully they can figure something out there. Uh, I think it would be a good opportunity for them to be able to make some big progress in that aspect. So hopefully they can actually do it because, I mean, if Fabio can't qualify well, he's in big trouble. Yes. And I hope Fabio will be good because it's good for MotoGP. Fabio seems yeah. to have a good personality. Yeah, he Fabio does. is very likable. He is a little bit more um, outgoing from his personality. I don't know how to say. Um, extroverted. Yes, he's a yeah. little bit more extroverted. And um, it's, it's good for him uh, to be good, of course. But it's also good for MotoGP if Fabio is good. And also, it's good for MotoGP if Mark Marcus is good, which brings us to the next uh, yes. big, big problem child, uh, which is Honda. <laughs> yeah, problem child is correct. <laughs> yeah. What's up with the Honda in general? Like, maybe please recap the last three years from 2020, <laughs> when they had the very, very good bike for Mark Marcus. Yes. Obviously, like, people... Uh, I don't know if people really remember how good Mark Marcus was in 2020 when he was on track because yeah, it's crazy. He tried in this uh, what was it turn three, turn four in Jerez mm -hmm. and uh, was like 15th or whatever. Came back and overtook everybody. Was in second or third place and then he had this crash. Yeah, and he would have wiped the floor with everybody in the season. And, um, of course, then his injury history, everybody knows about it, but Honda kind of lost track since Mark Marcus wasn't there anymore. So maybe explain a little bit what happened inside of Honda there. Yeah, a uh, good place to start, as you pointed out, is with that Jerez race in 2020. Um, yeah, when the world went into meltdown, then we eventually got back underway and Mark was back to doing his usual shenanigans and making me absolutely crap myself after you know, one of his ridiculous saves. Um, honestly, that, that like, comeback through the field, as you said, was insane. Like, it was the most incredible piece of riding I've ever seen in my life. I was sat there in my chair in Dorna HQ, you know, and I was like, Jesus, if he rides like this, he's going to win every race for the next 10 years, you know? Like, I remember ringing my dad last night, uh, that night, um, 
and saying to him like dad have you seen the gp yet and he's like no no i said you need to watch it because mark is insane the comeback he pulls off is just ridiculous um obviously then it all went very very pear-shaped uh and as you say honda kind of lost their way it's it's a tricky thing you know it's, it's whether like honda lost their way or what because they just kind of lost their, their main man that everything was kind of built around the bike was obviously made to fit for him essentially you know he had this freakish uh nature and ability with the front end and the bike was you know obviously based all around the front end so after mark left and all that sort of stuff then they lost their way for a while as you say and realized that results weren't coming and they needed to change something big with the bike so they did um what they did was they well we think anyway at least from the kind of images and what we can see were like the engine mount points we believe that they just rotated the engine backwards to pitch some weight onto the rear um obviously when you do that it upsets like the whole balance of the bike and then you need to readjust everything and that's what we saw you know like they ended up with kind of the big tail unit at the back for the, the 22 bike and all this sort of stuff and it was at least from the first tests everyone was raving about how honda had hit the ground running with this new bike uh they had the rear grip they wanted and they were just struggling a bit with the front but they were working on it and everyone kind of thought ah oh, they'll be fine like eventually they'll have the front end feeling and it should be good but then as they went chasing that front end feeling they kind of it seems like they realized that okay if we want to have the front end feeling or at least close to the front end feeling that we like then we lose everything that we had at the rear at the start when we first kind of rolled the bike out and so i think it just pretty much they saw that it was impossible with this bike to get where they want to be and be as competitive as they want to be so then for this year honda it looks like they've moved the engine again slightly and they've gone back slightly forwards only a very small amount compared to 22 and nowhere near far forwards as what it was with the 2021 bike before um but yeah it looks like they've moved the the weight a little bit forwards again so hopefully you know as we can kind of guess they're looking to get a little bit better from feeling back and also try and keep the the rear grip there or at least recover the rear grip because at the end of the year last year they had no front feeling and no rear grip <clears throat> so it's a bit tricky um the plan test was pretty interesting because Mark, the first two days, was not a happy boy. Like, he was really frustrated the second day when he came for an interview at the end of the day. Um, and it just seemed like, obviously, there's, there's Ken Koichi this year as well, who was the kind of technical lead at Suzuki. He's now gone to HRC. And from what we know, at least, it sounds like Ken was like, he wanted to see kind of every path of working for himself, even if it was something Honda had gone over before. So it sounds like Mark was essentially a very busy boy testing lots and lots of different items and bike concepts and stuff like this before then they just let him loose on the two kind of base 2023 bikes. Um, so yeah, the first two days Mark was really unhappy, but the second day when Alex, Joan and Taka came in for interview, they were all quite positive that they made a good step with lap time and the kind of feeling on the bike and we're getting more confident, particularly Joanne and Alex, which obviously that, you know, off the Suzuki is a big change. So that was quite interesting. And then the third day when Mark came back for interview at the end of the test and, you know, on the third day, he just had the two bikes and he worked on those base 23 bikes. Um, he seemed much happier. Like he kind of, you know, seemed like he made some progress and was making the same progress that, the other three guys had been making since day one um so yeah i don't know i think there's a bit of hope at honda this year to be honest i don't think it's as doom and gloom as last year they're still quite a step behind ducati and even aprilia but um yeah they don't look as bad as last year i remember in 2022 i was in barcelona and um, we were at rocker's ranch with remy and um Paul happened to be there. So uh, me and Paul, we talked maybe like 20 minutes. And basically what he said was that the 2021, which was still like the old Honda version, like the Mark Marcus thing, mm -hmm. uh, was more balanced towards the front. He said you had basically no rear grip, like yeah. you had all the 
the front feeling in the world. Yeah. And um, then he said the new bike is a little bit more balanced, more balanced towards the rear. And this uh, basically confirms what you just said. And um, then he had an incredible test in Indonesia. He had an incredible first race in Qatar. And then something happened from Indonesia onwards. And I believe something was with the tires in Indonesia, which Michelin changed. Yeah. So um, this is the first thing I would like to uh, discuss with you. And the second thing is that the Mark Marcus DNA Honda, as we uh, as we mentioned, is more balanced towards the front. So maybe this is the way Honda is going now again to suit the bike more to Marcus and not to develop it away from Marcus, because my opinion is when you have a rider being there from uh, 2013 to 2020, 2021 ish, whatever, and you have a bike set up in this direction, which is super heavy on the front and uh, pretty loose on the rear, it has a reason. And the reason is Mark Marcus. He was incredibly successful on this bike. And now uh, when Mark Marcus was injured, they moved a little bit away. And I feel like when they feel like Mark Marcus is capable of winning again, that they should develop the bike more, more towards him. Maybe that's what they're doing when uh, they shift the balance more towards the front. So uh, yeah, let's talk about the tires first. What happened with the tires in uh, 2022 and how is it still affecting Honda right now? So for the... The tyres, um, what they did at the test was they brought, because uh, it was the first time anyone had ever been to Indonesia, so they brought kind of the standard uh, range of tyres that Michelin would kind of take to most circuits in the, around the world. Um, and then from there, after they went away and then before they came back for the GP that year, uh, last year, um, obviously Michelin looked at the data and they kind of adjusted their tyre selection to what they think would suit the track better. What they did was they brought a tire that had a different casing. I think it was a softer casing, if I'm not mistaken. I can't really remember off the top of my head now. Um, but they brought this softer casing, and it just essentially it didn't work for some of the manufacturers. Like the, the tire worked, obviously, but it just didn't suit um, their bike and, and the way they were riding. And Honda were the big losers, really, in that. They really struggled with this different casing rear tire. Um it's not the case that that tire is still being used at every race. Um, you know, Michelin bring kind of slightly different tires to, to several race tracks throughout the year. Um, so I don't know if that casing is still in use or, or not. I'm not massively up to date on, on all the Michelin tech uh, stuff. Um, but yeah, essentially that was the problem. When they went back to Indonesia, they found that, you know, they put in all the settings that they had in the test and they were like, oh, crap this doesn't work because the tire is completely different so then the whole weekend they were chasing their tails trying to make a bike work that just wasn't going to work with that tire um and as we saw it went a little bit wrong for mark which was a well, yeah a scary crash and very very thankful that it wasn't you know in terms of his injury with a diplopia it wasn't as long as a, a step away as, as what it could have been and with the new honda when they move towards the front, do you feel like Mark Marcus is uh, back to being more competitive? Yeah, for sure. I think it'd be more competitive. But I don't think, as you said, I don't think it's Honda building a bike around Mark. I think it's them just building a better bike now. Um, they've seen what's happened when they build a bike around a rider and that rider suddenly disappears. You know, they've had their three worst seasons in their history. Um, so they're not going to make that same mistake again. You know, this 2023 RCV is not going to turn into Mark Marquez's bike. I think it's just going to turn into a better Honda for everyone. Um, Mark did say he had better feeling with the front, but still not like that kind of magic feeling that he kept saying last year, that special feeling. Um, and that special feeling he'll only ever, ever have again if they bring, you know, the old style of bike with very front, focus but that just won't work in my gp now the rear tire is way too important for lap time um so you know it's like mark says himself he says that the 2022 bike is a better bike and a faster bike than the 21 bike it's just that it's a 
you know, for him at least, it's a very different bike than what he's used to. If you're Honda and you're looking back at the last 10 years, would you rather have six world championships, seven good seasons with a bike around one rider and then run the risk of him getting injured and having three shitty seasons? Or would you rather have a bike which suits everybody and is good with no titles and basically no dominance? Yeah, I mean, you'd rather have the titles. Like, there's there's no two ways about that. We go racing to win. Uh, if you're not there to win, then there's no point going. So they would much rather have the titles for sure. But uh, the trouble is they went for a bike style that suited Bond Rider and they got those titles, yes, but it wasn't particularly the best future-proofing. Um, you see the way Ducati are doing it now, where everyone can ride that bike. And now that everyone can ride the bike, uh, there's one rider that's been able to kind of elevate and ride at a higher level than the others and finally win a title. So there's evidence, obviously, that the other way works as well. Uh, but I think it's just... It's silly in a sport where, you know, maybe you would have a star rider that gets a decade at the top performing at their very best and being able to fight for a world title. I think it's silly to build a bike around them, knowing that at some point they're going to disappear and retire. Uh, obviously, it works. And at the start of Mark's career, because he was obviously a very special case that came in and won in his rookie year, you can't blame them for doing it because it's like, well, shit, this guy's going to be here for, you know, the next 15 years sort of thing, or 10 years if he wants to, whatever. So we have enough time to be able to just make this bike as good as we can for him. Uh, but your trouble is now that they've obviously seen the backhanded side effect of that. So, Is this now a case of Honda not fully trusting Mark Marcus to stay healthy? or not fully committing to him because they are afraid that he might leave after his contract expires? Is there this kind of fear, or is it just that Honda wants to build a bike more like Ducati, which suits everybody, and it has nothing to do with Mark Marcus? Yeah, I don't think it has anything to do with any lack of trust of you know Mark staying healthy or Mark staying around, uh, nothing like that. I think between those two, like between Mark and... HRC, they trust each other indefinitely. Like, uh, I think we would only ever see Mark leave HRC if it was really, really like there was no hope at all. Um, obviously, it's been very, very bad recently, but Mark only had his fourth surgery on his arm after Magello last year. So he's had, you know, half a season back with the bike. And if already after his half season back with a bike, they've made a bit of a step for 2023, then he can see the promise and the hope. Um, so there's no reason really for Mark to leave, I don't see. Like, I don't see him in the next couple of years stepping away from Honda. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. But as I say, I think it's just HRC like trying to build a better bike overall now. Many people see this Alex Marcus to Grisini as kind of a test run, a free trial, if you want yeah, to, right. for Mark Marcus. Uh, but yeah, I actually don't see this happening because if, if you're Ducati, uh, you'd be not stupid. But if you have Inea Bastianini and Pekka and you have Bezeki in the wings, you have Karl Frohe Martin, maybe they'll bring up Pedro. Who knows what's happening with Ducati and all the promise that you'd be stupid if you replace someone uh, like Inia or Pedro with Mark Marcus, who's obviously a much more decorated rider, but with his injury history, you don't necessarily do that when you plan for the future. I have to say, I don't think you'd be stupid. I just think you'd be very brave, <laughs> you know? Um, there's, there's the, well... I mean, Mark is still, you know, probably, well, he is. He's the best rider out there, let's say. Um, even though now, obviously, he rides in a slightly different way to what he did before. I think if you put every single MotoGP rider on, best, on equal machinery, you would have Mark, Fabio, Aneo, and Pecco that kind of rise to the top as the best four. Um, you know, and it would be a, a pretty close battle out of 
out of particularly Mark and Fabio, I think, as to who is really the best rider. But, you know, like we see what Mark does with the Honda last year and the way he rode it in Australia, where he turned it to a circuit where it was limiting the Honda's weak points and he almost went and won the thing on a bike that was had no business being at the front of that race. So it's pretty tricky. You know, like obviously Ducati would be very, very brave to bring him in now and particularly bin off one of Pecco or Enea because that's a combo that we could see Factory Ducati be stable for the next five, six seasons if, if they works. Um, but yeah, I don't think you'd be stupid, just brave. I would uh, agree with your ranking if Mark never was injured. Like in his head and his capabilities may be still the same, but with his injury, I would say uh, Fabio is the best, Peko second, and Mark third. But yeah, I guess. Hey, that's why we all that's, debate it. That's why we have yeah. opinions, isn't it? So it doesn't it doesn't matter anyway because they still have different bikes, and so there's no point of debating that. I guess. <laughs> if wow, well, yeah, we can try if we want. We could go on for hours, but. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, regarding Honda, we have uh, Joan Mir and Alex Rins coming from Suzuki, and especially Joan Mir is an interesting case because because I've heard that he has a very aggressive riding style naturally, and he basically had to tame this to ride the Suzuki because the Suzuki obviously is a more smooth bike in a way. And um, now he's on a Honda, which requires more of an aggressive style, which could suit him very well. So this is the theory I just throw out. So uh, mm. do something with it, please. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you largely. Um, he's, he had, definitely has an aggressive style. Uh, I think the best point, sorry, the best evidence to prove that point is when Mir did his Moto 2 season. Obviously, he only had one Moto 2 season. Uh, and he did it on the old Honda 600s. And those Honda 600s were just a, a street bike engine, essentially. Like, you have to rev the nuts off them to get any power out of them. Um, and the guys that go well on those, that went well on them immediately, they're the more aggressive guys because it's a bike where you kind of had to really just grab it by the horns and just get everything out of it. Um, so I think, you know, Mir's natural riding style is just, suited to being slightly more aggressive um he obviously showed that he can do the smooth side of it too because you know he won a world title with suzuki and got the better of alex rins who is a pretty incredible rider when he's on form um so yeah there's definitely i think there's a bit of promise and a bit of hope around mir at honda like I, i do think he'll do well and the other part of it like he will not give a single shit that mark marquez is his teammate he's not afraid of anyone You know, Mir is a very quiet, nice guy, but yeah, he's a demon. Like, it's going to be very interesting to see those two. And I really think it's a pairing that is going to take Honda back to competitiveness. We uh, attended the race last year in Austria. And, uh, you know, Medi Scordia, now Patterson and Simon Patterson. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, met at a camping site. A lot of people hate them. But uh, they have been really, really kind to me. And uh, me and my girlfriend, they invited us over to their camping space. We uh, we uh, made some pizza. We talked a lot about MotoGP. So very, very friendly, those two. Yeah. And I have nothing bad to say about them. But the reason I'm telling the story is we talked about Joan Mir too. And Simon uh, told us that Joan Mir's crew chief was very, very optimistic about the whole... Uh, on that change because it was um, not official back then, but behind the curtain, basically everybody knew. Yeah. And uh, he said, uh, once it gets official and once uh, Joan Mia is on the Honda, I, his crew chief said that it might go very well. And I said, yeah, that's what his crew chief uh, obviously will tell you. And he was like, no, he would tell if, yeah, yeah. if it wasn't uh, this case. So. Um, apparently, a lot of people are very optimistic about Joan Mir going to Honda, and maybe they knew some things that I didn't knew or I didn't know. And um, yeah, I'm very, very excited to see Joan Mir on the Honda. But with Alex Rins, I don't necessarily have the same 
trust in it because I felt like the Suzuki was perfect for Alex Rins the way it was in 2022, especially towards the end and towards the beginning where, where he was very, very good. And yeah, unfortunately, I don't necessarily see him being good on the Honda. Well, <clears throat> the interesting thing is, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say about uh, what Frankie Carcetti said about me. Uh, yeah, listen to your crew chiefs. Like, they don't lie. They they know exactly what that rider does and the, the bad habits they have to force out of them and tell them how to ride. Um, it's something I've learned. My dad was a, a well, is a crew chief and has been for for his whole career, uh, worked in MotoGP and World Superbike and British Superbikes and all this sort of stuff. So he's always kind of told me, like, you know, the, the crew chiefs know what's going on. If they tell you that this guy will suit this bike, then it's, it's very likely it will happen. Um, but for Rins, uh, it was really interesting, actually, because uh, I asked both Mir and Rins, like, you know, how much has your riding style changed after hopping off for Suzuki? And, and Joanne went, well, like, everything's changed. And then Rins went, ah, not so much, actually. And it's like two completely different approaches. It's crazy, honestly. Like, I really expected them to be the exact same and just say, um, you know, like, ah, oh, kind of throwing everything out the window, have to change the riding style, all this sort of stuff. But Rins <clears throat> was talking about adapting the bike to him and Mir was the other way around and just adapting to the bike. And that's kind of the, like, Casey Stoder, Mar Marquez approach of, you know, just get on the bike and do what it needs. Um, so it'd be very interesting. Uh, I'm not saying from that that I think Rins will go badly. Rins actually surprised me at the test. He did really well, I think, um, and didn't have some of the newer parts that Mir had either. So it's going to be interesting. I think there'll be times in the year where Rins is making Joanne sweat, but as I agree with you, that I think that Joanne will go very well and Rins might struggle a little bit. I hope that he will uh, do better than I think because I like Alex Rins. Uh, yeah. And his his riding style was always so smooth and yeah. so clean and it just doesn't feel right to put him on the Honda. And the way I, uh, the way of riding I associate with the Honda is Mark Marquez with the rear dangling and doing everything he can to uh, to push the thing into the corner and a lot of crashes over uh, not not only over the front and also the rear or the high sets he had just to test his limit and to be really really aggressive and of course as we discussed the characteristics of the horn the massively have changed but still this image is imprinted in my head and i feel like that alex rins with his riding style is not necessarily getting the best out of the honda i, I think <clears throat> i'm sorry to cut you off um i think in one point just as a devil's advocate to that uh i think rins is saved a little bit by the way that motor gp has evolved uh in that with these bikes you do have to be much smoother but you can't necessarily force the issue so much the way that the they work with the rear tire you know you have to use that um to stop really well like you have to be smooth on the brakes you have to have it on the ground or at least some sort of traction and connection there and with the aero as well, like I've, I think Rins will be saved a little bit by that. But the way that the lap time comes now, they have to be ridden a little bit smoother. But of course, there is still that kind of, you know, just grab it by the horns and kind of force it into submission approach that works obviously for Mark and others. So it'll be interesting. One thing before we'll move on, what was up with the whole Honda without the wings uh, situation? I think... Well, basically, you know, if Honda have moved this engine again, then what they have is a, a bike where their data from last year doesn't apply anymore. You know, they have a bike with different balance, or at least applies still because the bike is still the same concept, but it's a little bit different again. Um, I think really that was just them understanding exactly what the base bike does, how it behaves rather than how it behaves once you start adding the aero on. Because... Uh, it was like Brado ran with no arrow, then he ran with like half of the wings. I saw a photo where Honda looked like they just kind of fucking cut the wings in half or just tore them in half and put only half of them on. Uh, saw him running with that and then also just like the dino wings on the back and stuff like that. So I think it was them assessing 
how the bike works and then really understanding right if we add this on then what does it change you know what good qualities do we get from this what bad qualities and just building up data basically i think that was it i can't remember who said this i thinking about it i think uh simon said this simon prefer that the youth <laughs> manufacturers are building the aero into the bike more and the Japanese manufacturers are building a bike and then putting error on it. I don't remember if Simon said it, but I'm like 70% sure. And thinking about the whole Honda without the wing situation, which it was really refreshing to see a bike without all these spoilers. I would love to see them more. But um, this kind of um, is a sign to me that Honda is a little bit desperate on what to do. And that it that the statement from uh, Simon, hopefully, <laughs> if it's not from Simon, please correct me. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> then this might be true that they have a bike and do things with the bike, and then at the end put like the error on it. Yeah, um, I think the principle is correct. Maybe not that they're desperate, but I think it's more that uh maybe they were just desperate for time because obviously testing time is so limited um and they only have you know a handful of days with their actual gp riders um i think it was purely them trying extremes and you know kind of getting some data in an extreme direction so they kind of know ah this is like the extreme of this so this is how it will kind of behave if we take this quite far um and kind of being able to then rule out avenues without having to explore them too much and go step by step in them um only my theory like and i actually agree whether it was simon or not that said that little quote i actually agree with that i think that's very like spot on um it has seemed like that obviously this year yamaha have obviously stepped the game up with the aero and stuff like that so they seem to be getting more involved and honda we know that they kind of did that halfway through last season so hopefully we'll see them get more towards the ethos of the European manufacturers. But no, I agree. I do agree that like, particularly Ducati um, and Aprilia, just at the minute, they seem like they're light years ahead with the aero than, than Honda and Yamaha. Talking about the whole aero stuff, <clears throat> ATM apparently is cooperating with Red Bull Racing to fix the whole aero stuff. And the KTM obviously isn't the best bike on the grid is has many problems and what remy told me was that he didn't experience much front end feeling with the ktm and uh, this whole front end thing was also a big impact in 2021 when michela changed the tire allocation on the front so the favorite ktm tire basically was no longer available and they struggled for a front end feeling a lot so ktm is doing basically everything they can with uh with uh, signing engineers from ducati basically ktm is italian now with cooperating with uh, Red Bull Racing to fix the error, all of this. So what exactly is going on at KTM in preparation for the season? Because on the outside, KTM looks like a huge mess where they don't know what the they're doing. <laughs> um, KTM are a tricky one in MotoGP. MotoGP is an incredibly difficult uh, discipline. Uh, I think the thing that people forget about KTM is that whatever off-road market they've gone into, they've dominated, you know, uh, they figured it out in motocross, in enduro, all this sort of stuff. Like they, they know how to build a motorcycle that works in various disciplines. Like they just know how to do it. Uh, MotoGP is obviously a discipline that's like different for them. And I think the biggest thing was that they came into MotoGP without any real road bike knowledge either like they'd only ever built one super bike that v twin was it called the rc8 and that was ages ago and it's not really relevant at all to my gp so they kind of just yeah it was almost like a startup if you know what i mean like they just kind of dove in and went yeah we'll give it a go um for this year it's a bit tricky though because obviously they ktm have been vocal about the fact that they didn't really want complicated aerodynamics in MotoGP. They wanted it to be a bit more of a pure discipline. Um, but they've 
accepted now that you know to win a MotoGP you have to go into the aero. So they have, and we saw like the first products of that partnership with Red Bull Advanced Technologies with the the aero that now has those ground effect side fairings and all that sort of stuff. So they're definitely working on that. Um, and it sounds from that, I think Paul, Paul's answer about the new era was quite good, where he said it gave better turning and it also helped with top speed. Um, so it, obviously it is working a, a little bit to an extent. But uh, if I remember rightly, Remy always said that he had to push so hard with a KTM and it was just impossible to get any like kind of compliance out of the bike. Um, obviously the big difference with KTM is that they run a steel chassis compared to aluminium. They're the only manufacturer to do the steel chassis. So whether it's a trait of that, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know, but also it could just be a whole thing with their bike, whether it's, you know, too much on the front end compared to other bikes or all that sort of stuff. So it's difficult. Um, I think the telling thing was that Miller uh, over the Sepang test, he'd like already by the end of day two, I think it was, uh, he said that he'd hit a wall with his setup and was struggling to go any faster. Um, and I imagine that's something similar to what happened with Remy and Raul last year. So I don't know, KTM, there was a lot of promise after the Valencia test that they'd taken a step forward, but and they, they definitely have taken a step forward, but it seems like it was a smaller step than we thought and that maybe they're actually still in trouble a lot. With KTM, they obviously have the steel frame. And the reason I don't trust the steel frame <coughs> is back when KTM entered Moto2. They had all the WP data from the IO team who ran with mm -hmm. the Alex John Zarco from over two years. If you hear the cat in the background, she wants to come <laughs> out. So I'll be back in three seconds. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> she has been very quiet over the last hour and 20 minutes. So yeah, she's done well. She deserves to go out now and <laughs> what's going on there. Yeah, basically was what I was saying. With the IO team in uh, 2014, 15 and 2016, I believe, they uh, won the two championship with uh, Joan Zarco and had the WP suspension on the bike. And they collected all the data from the Carlex and with KTM entering in 2018 or 17? I, don't, I in 2017. think 17, yeah. Yeah, in 17, they entered the Moto2 category with their own bike. They basically built a Carlex. Everything was the same except for the steel frame. And I don't trust the steel frame to do anything good or not anything good, but be consistently good in, uh, in MotoGP or in road racing in general. I mean, in Moto3, they kind of figured it out. But in Moto2, the thing was totally unpredictable. It went up and down in performance. And it's like the usual KTM thing. You have maybe five good races season where you you seem to be really good and then you have uh 15 races where you are absolutely nowhere and ducati had maybe the a similar problem with the monocoque uh, frame mm. and they changed it and went to a steel frame and also i don't know why you shouldn't run early in because Honda has their own suspension. Yamaha has their own suspension. They said, fuck that. I want the Erlins because it's the best. So those two reasons from a bike perspective is why I don't trust KTM. Yeah. <clears throat> and so the whole, whole rider changing thing and uh, yeah, it's a mess. And I feel like you can't develop a bike when you don't have a consistent rider lineup. If you're putting rookies in there every time, if you're sacking them after one or two seasons, if you have a rider like Miguel Oliveira who rides the bike, basically he has since 2015, with the exception of one season, always ridden the steel framed uh, KTM. And they they kind of sacked him for Jack Miller 
when they didn't extend his contract and offered him a demotion to Tech 3, which in my opinion is uh, is basically an insult to a rider like Miguel Oliveira, who's the best rider KTM has on paper. Um, even though I think Brad Binder is the better rider overall, Miguel Oliveira was the more successful rider. So those things that the KTM has the steel frame, which apparently isn't as good as the aluminum frame, the suspension, which in my opinion isn't as good as the Ölins, and the whole management structure where you don't have consistent riders, where you're changing uh, things and doing, let's say, questionable decisions. Those things combined don't make me believe that anything in KTM will change over the next few years and they will still have three, four, five good races this year. But if you look at the ways where, or the races where KTM was good last season, you had the two rain races and uh, you had maybe two or three races where Brett Binder did something really well, but they had no qualifying pace at all. Brett Binder is doing miracles on the thing. I don't know what he's doing, but when you, I feel like he and Miguel saved KTM in a lot of occasions. And yeah, those uh, pieces combined, um, I once had a meme, uh, <laughs> which basically sums it up pretty well. It was a headline from the MotoGP site, uh, from the MotoGP uh, website, which says Raul Fernandez figured out the MotoGP puzzle and had like a puzzle with four puzzle pieces, which <laughs> said don't ride for KTM. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately, it's the truth. And I don't uh, think because of all those things are listed that KTM will be not any good. They will have good races, of course, but they yeah. won't championship because they can't be consistently good with the package they have right now and the management structure around it is catastrophic as well yeah i've i mean i can't comment comment for the the management structure because well, i mean you, in reality we have no idea like kind of how it all runs actually in in that structure you know from the inside Obviously, it's just my uneducated yeah, yeah yeah no of course um i can see why like you say you know with riders changing all the time and you know the way that they kind of didn't give the quota any kind of sympathy and stuff like this um yeah the wp thing i mean i know that's like a global partnership that they always you know uh, run wp doesn't matter if it's MotoGP, gp mx gp supercross whatever um although they're actual consumer bikes as well i wouldn't yeah, I, I mean, there's always this perception that because everyone runs Olens, they are the best. Um, I'm sure that WP is, you know, 1% difference to Olens. Like, it can't be far. There'll obviously be slight differences between, you know, maybe Olens does this thing better and WP does that thing better. But in reality, I think if they change their Olens, maybe it doesn't make too much of a difference. Um, saying that, there's been some cool examples recently in Superbike, like Honda changed from Olens back to Showa uh at the start of last season i think at the start of 2022 um and you know we've no idea if it actually made a difference but maybe it, it felt better to the rider um a lot of the times you'll find that you know the brand of suspension is a thing that this in their head that they think oh yeah this feels better for me but maybe it doesn't actually help with lap time but just because they feel better then they go faster uh the steel chassis thing is always a, a point of intrigue, isn't it? Because it's like, why do something different to the guys that are winning? If you're going to beat them, then beat them at their own game. You know, it's like a classic thing with, uh, it's like in the late 90s with the Ducati domination in superbikes. And then Honda went and built a V-twin and won with it. It's like, okay, we can beat them with a V4. So we'll go and build a V-twin and win the world championship. And then it's done. So it's always that kind of debate. But KTM, we know that they're very strong in their ways. They're not going to change and go and build an aluminium chassis. There's no way. So they have to make it work. And at the minute, as you say, it's like they have these good races every year and then the rest of it, they're kind of nowhere and struggling. And it's been that way ever since the start, since they came into MotoGP. You know, maybe at the start of the year, they had a couple of good races and that meant they finished 12th. But now obviously a good race is that they fight for the win or the podium 
and the rest of them, then they're struggling to break top 10. Um, so they have made progress, but, you know, I think they they initially said when they started in MotoGP, I think they said in like their first third season, they want to fight for the world title. And obviously that didn't happen. You know, we're a long way past their third season now. Um, there's no doubt that they can fight for the world title with riders like Brad Binder. Um, but, you know, the bike obviously just isn't there to do it. So it's very tricky. We know that at the minute, like the KTM's biggest weaknesses is it has this tendency to be so on the limit on the front and that uh, it's really hard to get the feeling you want with the front end. But then also they have problems at the back where, you know, they have this monster engine, but they can't really use this monster engine because they don't have good grip and traction coming out the corner and it just spins. Uh, and the other thing as well is they struggle in turning. And if you can't turn, then you can't get on the power early. So all of a sudden you've got, ah, oh, crap. Well, I struggle on the brakes, I struggle in the corner and I struggle out of the corner. Well, that's a racetrack, so you're going to be a bit slow. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, it's weird with KTM. Um, every year we kind of think, you know, well, last year was a slightly different example, coming into 22, because we knew that they were going to struggle. And then they kind of surprised us uh, with the podium in Qatar with Binder. But if you look at Qatar, it was kind of, you know, Qatar's not a place that has big acceleration points, and it's quite fast and flowing and it's a place where you kind of can let the bike turn naturally and kind of force it a little bit with you know spinning it and sliding it with the rear so obviously they're gonna not do too badly there compared to somewhere else so yeah it's it's very very tricky um it will be interesting to see what happens to paul Spargaro's early smile after he got on it because we know paul wears his um Wears his heart on his sleeve. So if all of a sudden Paul is looking quite miserable, then you know the situation. Yeah. And in Qatar, also a Honda was on the podium with Paul. So yeah. some strange was up anyways at that weekend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it wasn't not necessarily, it wasn't your normal MotoGP weekend with a Grisini winning and a GP22 being nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> It was a strange weekend, but one thing I would like to discuss um, with now Aprilia, KTM, kind of Ducati, kind of Yamaha, the whole ground effect thing. Because mm -hmm. in my world, a ground effect on a car has this um, has this basic function of a lot of air coming in, then it gets uh, smaller and sm smaller, so the air travels faster, and therefore the car gets sucked on the ground. Yeah. And this whole effect isn't possible if you have no uh, low pressure zones underneath the car. And obviously, a motorbike is completely structured differently. So I don't, I don't necessarily understand a how the whole ground effect thing works on a motorcycle. And B, if it's really a ground effect thing or if it's something different and we just call it ground effect because, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong. A ground effect is something completely different than what we see or what is in general possible on a motorcycle who has to go in, into corners. So, uh, yeah, could you elaborate a little bit on this and educate me? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm certainly no aerodynamicist. I do like to, to have a... A look at on YouTube and kind of dive into all the videos, analyzing the aerodynamics of all the F1 cars and stuff like that. Um, I like to read about it all and do my research because it's it's where it's a dark art and it's quite interesting to know like what's happening that you can't see. Um, it it seems it is actually ground effect. Like there's been interviews with several kind of uh, former F1 aerodynamicists that have spoken about the idea, and even as early as when Ducati unveiled their first uh, little wheel covers um back in whenever that was pre-season of 2019 or something like that um there was uh, an aerodynamicist that did an interview i think it was with matt oxley or some or someone i can't remember anyway um and he said about that that was exploring the idea so i guess it's more of a thing that the low pressure zone is maybe after it i don't really know or towards the end of that fairing um, if you look at the Aprilia one this year, there's a clear point where the fairing, to say, if you're looking at it from the side or whatever, 
the variant kind of comes in like this and then it kind of kicks in like that, like kind of how a diffuser would out the back of an F1 car. So I guess maybe that's where it's doing the work. But um, yeah, it's, it's difficult to know. Uh, it's obviously quite complex now with aerodynamics in, in MotoGP, or at least more complex than it has been. I'm sure F1 guys are laughing at us for saying it's complex. But um, yeah, it's, it's getting interesting. You know, I think the biggest thing that is quite interesting was even more so than the ground effect stuff was when Ducati brought the little downwash ducts or the diffusers, as, as some people call them, because that's obviously a clear thing where it's forcing air out, so it creates lower pressure behind it. Um, and I think it's very interesting, actually, with the way that Bagnaia seems quite set on the fact that he prefers those ducts to the ground effect, the fat side fairings. Um, you know, because you would say that the ground effect side fairing is obviously only going to work when it gets, you know, uh, lent over and it actually is close to the tarmac, whereas those ducts will kind of work all the time to a certain degree. So, yeah, it's it's a little bit interesting, really. I would love to talk about it with uh, somebody who really knows aerodynamics. Yeah, me too. Because I studied engineering and I don't understand the flying fuck about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I never worked into in aerodynamics as well, and I feel like uh, that what you learn in university is like a small fraction of what's really going on. And if yeah, you right. really understand stuff, that you really need to spend multiple yeah. years into uh, this field. Um, I mean, I mean, yeah. most of the stuff I learn about aerodynamics. I don't know if you know the YouTube channel Kyle Engineers. I don't know if you've heard of it. He's a he was a I think he's an Australian guy. Um, and he was a aerodynamicist for Mercedes F1 in like 2018, 2019, and 2020. And he does kind of breakdown videos. Like recently, with all the livery launches, he's done uh, breakdown videos of kind of how the, all the various aerodynamic devices work on the car, at least what he sees and what he thinks. They're quite good to watch, actually. I will look into it. But uh, I've got to be honest, it's not necessarily my biggest interest. <laughs> no, so, it's, it's uh, quite, quite geeky. <laughs> so. There's a reason I don't know it. Um, but yeah, talking about Aprilia, it seems like the Aprilia is more of an evolution. And um, what's weird is that they didn't even bring the new engine to the test. So what's up with this? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't panic about that. Um, Crayfar was talking to... Uh, Paolo Benora, who's uh, Prelia's team manager, who's actually class. Like he explains stuff so brilliantly. I love him. Um, supposedly, the new engine has been like on the test bench in Aprilia's uh, workshop for months and months. And uh, by the time it comes to Portimao, like it should just be a, a ready package to basically plug in and go. They should know more or less how it's going to operate with the bike. So apparently, there's nothing really to worry about with the fact that it wasn't here in Sepang. What I've heard that Aprilia being a smaller factory, that they can't afford to just build things and ship them over uh, across the globe just for it uh, to not work. Like Honda, uh, they're doing so much and like 99% of it doesn't, even even 100% of it doesn't work right now. <laughs> so uh, Aprilia can't afford this. And um, therefore they are testing things better at home and then bringing things to the track which work as as sure as you can get that uh, things will work they make sure that they will work you know yeah and um therefore i think it's still like a risk because what if not there is still that factor yeah for sure and but yeah still uh do you think that they closed the gap to ducati more i think they closed the gap yeah yeah um it's obviously going to be difficult because even if they close the gap there's eight ducatis to beat rather than you know only being two aprilias for ducati to beat uh and your other thing is um the puzzling question of maverick finales so um yeah, but in terms of the bike itself, it sounds like it's taken a step up again, um, which is so impressive because, as you say, Aprilia, a small factory, you know, when they develop something, they have to make sure it's better. Uh, and every year since they brought that new bike around the new engine in 2020, the bike has taken a huge step each season. So, Yeah, and do you think that 
Aprilia's kind of dip in performance towards the end of the season, which was more a lack of data, is now fixed because they have all the data and they had a pretty good bike last season. But since they didn't have all the data, they couldn't extract all the performance out of it. And now with the customer team, uh, RNF obviously, and um, all the data from last year, that they can be more competitive simply due to the fact that they can extract more performance out of a very competitive package rather than developing a new, more competitive package. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think the fact that, you know, as you say, they're going to have more data. Um, and the point about like whether it was them struggling at the end of last year because they didn't have all the data and they didn't understand everything uh, with the bike, I think is very valid, yeah. That because they were just on track and they didn't really have, you know, many much time to test. Obviously, they only have Savadori going to individual test days, and it's only one rider doing his work on his own. Um, so yeah, definitely, I think it was just a thing of that they were, you know, running out of, of things to explore with what actual data they had. So it's going to help for sure with RNF, particularly like as we've said about Miguel. Miguel's an incredible rider, and we know how good Ralph Fernandez is. So. I think that when they use that bike this year, it will be a better bike than what, you know, Aleish and Maverick had it as last year, just because they will have learned so much more about it. So even though they're going to be on a year old bike, I still think they'll do quite well. Of course, the new bike is a step up from last year's bike. So they are going to struggle to be fighting at the very top. But at least I think with the more data and experience now, we won't see them have the same struggles as Elation and Maverick had at the end of last year. You already touched a little bit on the whole Maverick thing because <laughs> Maverick, in my opinion, when you just consider raw talent, he's not there. Yeah. I don't know many riders who are better than Maverick and Alice, but for some reason, he can't keep it together as in qualifying and in the race because in free practice especially like free practice four which uh, doesn't matter or i don't know there is no free practice four anymore it's just practice one practice two and then like free, free practice, practice yeah three, right? yeah so he kind of always was good in practice then towards the qualifying it wasn't it wasn't necessarily um yeah his time to shine and then the first five, six, seven laps of a race, for some reason, I don't know if it's the full fuel tank or the new tires or whatever it is, I don't know, that he struggles. And with the whole sprint race uh, scenario each weekend, it doesn't get easier for Maverick because as soon as he figured out what uh, he has to do on the bike and gets, to, uh, gets up to his pace, the race is over, at least the sprint race. And uh, therefore... Do you know, A, what his struggles, uh, what the reason for his struggles are? And B, do you think he can fix it now with a little bit of time on Aprilia? Um, I think to an extent he kind of not fixed it, but he took a step in getting better at it last year. Um, after Aprilia introduced the ground effect side fairings halfway through the season, actually the next handful of races, Mavericks, that like starts and first couple of laps were much more positive. There was only a couple where he did a classic Maverick and then dropped back. Um, so I think he did actually already take a step in that. Uh, the, the biggest thing he always complains is that he has like no feeling in those first few laps, and whether it's because the you know the full fuel tank and the bike feels heavier than it did before and feels slightly different with the tires, um, it probably is just down to that. But I think then maybe the ground effect side fairings helped a fraction, you know, just loading up the tire when it's on the side a bit more and giving him a bit more of a, a secure and confident feeling. Um, at least that's my kind of theory with it anyway. But as we know, like we saw throughout last year, even towards the end of the year, he had some howlers of, of first laps. So um, hopefully he can take another step in it. But I think the biggest thing is that Maverick will always be a rider that just struggles in those first couple of laps and is never able to to really master that, um, which is unfortunate because, as you say, like when we were actually saying about the top riders in MotoGP, I forgot about Maverick. Um, I always say to like 
Jack up the yard and the guys here. Like on Maverick's day, he's one of the few guys that can run away from Mar Marquez. He's that good. Um, and it's just it's, a shame we don't see that every every time he goes on a motorcycle. Yeah, that's like the sad part about it because everybody who watches MotoGP for uh, a longer period of time have seen these glimpses of greatness. I, I remember Silverstone last year is a very good example. Or when he was in uh, Phillip Island on the Yamaha, when he won in Silverstone on the Suzuki and his second ever race in Moto2, as you said, the, those guys who get into Moto2 and uh, are successful early on, those are like the aggressive guys. It was in 2014, uh, he won the second or third race. I can't remember if if Austin was uh, before Argentina or after I don't know, they changed it a few times. Though. But it was, like the second or third race and he won it and the way he uh he competed in motor three when he was on the on the what was it, the ftr honda yeah ftr some yeah kind of thing which wasn't necessarily competitive when he was battling with uh, sandro cortese i believe you know those i don't get it together 100 percent because it's over 10 years ago now but we see these glimpses of greatness and then you see the harsh reality of Maverick not being able to perform, which certainly has some mental things as well, uh, some mental reasons as well. But um, yeah, it's it's sad because over his career, you see how good of a rider he can be. And I really hope that he can, can at least one time or one season can string it together and be consistently good. Yeah, I mean, I hope the same. Because if he does, like, they wouldn't see which way he went, you know. He's he's pretty incredible when he's on, but it's just so frustrating that, you know, maybe 15 times out of the 20, 21 races in the year, we're going to see a Maverick that doesn't do as good as he could do. Have you seen the YouTube video of Aleish and Maverick uh, oh, for... The Zipang test, the vlog from... No, I haven't watched it yet, actually. Apparently, it's very good. I haven't seen it yet, though. Yeah, it's really good because we're... it's two different styles of videos. Aleish is more like a vlog who shows a little bit on what's going on. It's not particularly about MotoGP, where he gives behind-the-scenes uh, informations about what's actually going on, but it's more like a look behind the scenes on how things work and they're yeah. like... Here's the, uh, I believe, uh, I can't remember who it was, but, but he uh, talked with many Aprilia guys and it was also friendly and he said a million times that now it's time for a coffee. It, it's really cute because Leish itself is like a very, very interesting person. And I would consider him a role model when you, again, when you consider the way he developed over his career. People don't understand how shitty the CRT bikes were. Yeah, yeah. And everybody who complains about eight Ducatis on the grid, uh, I tell them, yeah, <laughs> be lucky it's not eight CRT bikes on the grid. <laughs> and um, he worked his way up um, on the shitty Aprilia RART, this yeah. was the bike, to the Open Yamaha. Then he went to Suzuki as their first rider when Suzuki wasn't competitive. Then he got sacked and went to Aprilia, had to start all over again and went to a place where he almost uh, retired because he wasn't enjoying it and giving it one more go. And then all of a sudden it played out for him. And now he's in a situation where he uh, has a real shot at uh, winning a championship or even if it's just uh, a runner up or a third, this is an amazing achievement. And uh, I re I'm really rooting for him. I was rooting for him last season and I'm rooting for him this season because he seems like a nice guy. He uh, has gone through so much adversary, adversity, adversary, adversity, adversity. Yeah, adversity. Yeah. And it's a little bit uh, the same with Danilo Petrucci. You're just rooting for those guys because you've seen the way they uh, came up and now they're finally getting what they deserve and all the hard work is paying off. So I really enjoy uh, Aleish being successful. I enjoy that he's giving 
uh, a look behind the scenes on YouTube. I hope he continues to it because I, I think it's very important for MotoGP riders in general to, uh, to be a little bit more open to the public because it's a niche sport you don't necessarily get too much behind the scenes uh looks especially when you're a casual fan and don't subscribe to the video pass where you get all those video features where where like the nerds get a little more of the info but like as a casual fan um this is a really great source of information and maverick he had a pretty different style of doing the doing the video because he basically showed a little bit more on what's really going on behind the scenes. He prepares the race, what's going into his preparation, where he goes through his um, stuff and explains what stuff is for what for. For example, uh, what was really nice that he said, uh, when it's raining, he doesn't use the, um, the, uh, the, the big knee sliders. He always uses the small ones because, uh, I don't know, he has better feeling with it. So those uh, things are super interesting. And when you watch the MotoGP Unlimited documentary, Maverick in his private space, like his, his happy bubble, he was so cute and uh, with his wife and his baby and he seemed happy and it was so nice to see. It was like heartwarming. And um, therefore I, I really enjoy that the Aprilia boys are stepping their social media game a little bit up with the YouTube channel. I hope they continue it. And um, also, I hope Alonso Lopez uh, will add some English subtitles to his YouTube. <laughs> because <laughs> it, it's really frustrating when you get what you want, almost, and then yeah, you come yeah. because it's in, in a whole other language. Yeah. And Mavericks is uh, in English, and Aleix is in Spanish slash Italian Italy, yeah. um, with English subtitles. So yeah you get along with it but i really enjoy what they're doing i can totally recommend it no good i'm glad to hear that uh you know obviously um i haven't watched them yet but it's good to see them actually doing it and putting the effort in i hope it actually does trigger the other riders to do it as well because it's something we've always encouraged them to do as well you know to make their own content and all this but obviously riders are managed by various groups and it's largely down to you know their agents or or their uh, agencies to to do with them what they like but it's always something we encourage to them to do and particularly someone like Aleish who as you say is a good role model and all this um it's nice for that because I think Aleish is just a fantastic person for uh to be attached to MotoGP you know as, as a face in the public so you see a lot of uh UFC fighters doing stuff like podcasts or fight reviews or some are just streaming and not even talk about fighting but just putting their personality out there and gaining a lot of fans because they're showing themselves from a different perspective they um they make good money from it where they don't necessarily depend on fighting and really enjoy uh, those and as you said, you know, it's in, it's good for uh, for MotoGP if they do it, and when you guys are encouraging them, it's a great thing. So yeah, I really hope that uh, this spark will continue. Nah, me too. Uh, I would love to see them do more, like all the Supercross guys do as well. Loads of them do it. Yeah, I've seen Jonathan Ray, but I haven't watched his uh, vlogs because. Uh, yeah, I'm just going, getting into a uh, superbike now. Oh, yeah, I yeah, I guess good. It was always just MotoGP because um, superbike was so confusing with the whole stuff that they have three races, and I yeah. I always thought that hey, it's Saturday they have a race, and yeah. So, but uh, with Remy now in superbike, I I will be watching uh, frequently, and they have their first race coming up. Uh, yeah, they the do end. next weekend. Yeah, yeah, I'm very pumped pumped to see him uh, in Phillip Island. I hope he does well. He seemed very happy on the um, on the Yamaha. He did, yeah. 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 So I would like to, uh, since we discussed basically everything which happened in Malaysia, I would like to ask you a couple of things before I let you go. Sure. Uh, I'm going to have somebody from Donna here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you got to ask. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I know. But how did you, uh, how did you get the job? Ah, so I got the job um, 
well basically initially i wasn't actually looking to to work in motorsport like i did a, a degree in geography at university and i was looking to do um all stuff to do with like renewable energy and and the uh, and the transport market and stuff like that um anyway like applying to a lot of jobs like that i was just sick of essentially being turned down and i saw the job advertised on twitter by steve day um and yeah i just said to my dad like what do you think you reckon i should go for it and i think by this time i'd kind of figured out that i didn't really want to do what i was looking to do and just wanted to work in motorsport instead so i went for it and then i didn't hear back from dorna for a while because i think they advertised just before they all went on winter break basically um so then over the winter break, I'd actually sorted another job to work in British Superbike Championship with Pirelli. Uh, and then Dorna eventually got back to me. And so I managed to squeeze my way out of the other job and, and go work for Dorna. So it was literally like, I think my the guy that interviewed me called me. Uh, and then two weeks later, I was on the plane to Barcelona to come and move out here to work. So yeah, it was good. And how long have you been there? Uh, it is just over four years now so this is my fifth season working in MotoGP. and what's the process process on what uh, did you do at the beginning and how did your career develop in in the in those five years so largely still i do the the same role um when i first arrived i was MotoGP social media editor and then also for the talent cup so like british talent cup asian talent cup all of all of those um then the team grew uh When I first arrived, it was me, Lewis Sotheby, um, our boss, uh, and Matt Dunn, and that was it. And now there's like across MoGP, MotoGP Esport, all the talent cups. Uh, I think there's about 10 or 11 of us now, something like that. So I don't do the talent cup stuff anymore. Um, I do a lot more in terms of like actual general on the MotoGP accounts. Like we kind of ever since 2019 we do a lot more and like kind of actually go deeper into social media and do the smaller things as well as just the main things um and now really i do mainly just posting social media stuff um and also do presenting for MoGP esport and a little bit of commentary occasionally for junior gp And uh, what's the process of shooting an episode of uh, like After the Flag, for example? What what goes into this? In terms, for me, it's very easy. Uh, I just get told where to be, what to what to do, and then I just uh, turn up in front of the camera and talk about bikes, which is nice and easy. Um, in terms of actually organizing it, uh, one well, say for Sepang Test, um, a guy called Emilio was organizing it, who was. The nicest guy in the world and he's incredibly good at his job as well loves the bikes uh is there just for the enjoyment of it which is brilliant um and he organizes kind of or is one of the people that organizes kind of the structure and the content of the show so there'll be a whole bunch of cameramen i don't know how many we had in sepang but quite a few just for uh you know when we only turn up to cover the track action and, and atf um the guys back in barcelona so it was hosted by lewis sodeby and neil morrison they'll be there with a small production team as well that kind of sort the running order for the program uh, and they'll have a meeting during the day to talk about like the main things that they want to talk about and when they're going to talk about them and when they cut down to myself or simon crayfar to do a small segment on something like that um and then really it's it's just yeah they do the bulk of the work in terms of actually sorting okay we want simon here at this time or we want jack here at this time we'll cut down to you at approximately da -da -da. Um, so they do the bulk of that there's some very very good people uh, at the circuit that essentially plan a program within you know a handful of hours obviously they have a, a draft in their head but throughout the day obviously talking points change and they really sort the the nitty-gritty details of the program um you know not too long before it actually starts. So it's, it's quite like reactive work for those guys that actually have quite a responsible job to do. So so uh, with you uh, doing the social media for for uh, the MotoGP account, 
how high is the probability of uh, you reposting some memes? <laughs> Very low, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, obviously, depends what it's on, but yeah. Uh, in, in terms of reposting memes, I think that one we'll have to have a conversation about that. <laughs> Tell me your bank account number and yeah. maybe. Be like on your last day or something if you ever do something else <laughs> yeah right yeah i can leave with a, a little bit of a mic drop <laughs> i would like uh before we go into the q a i would like to ask you quickly on your uh, prediction for the model gp season and also model two and model three well um well i have a bold prediction that anea will beat peko uh or just beating him and somebody else winning the title? I don't know. It's tough. It's really tough. If the Honda is okay, Mark will be there or thereabouts, but he won't win the title, even if the Honda is okay. Um, I think those guys are just too good now. Um, for the title, oh, it's tricky. It's very tricky. I think I'd probably say Bastianini for the title. I can live with that. Mm -hmm. For Moto2 Moto and Moto3, you can't look past Lord Pedro, as you like to call him, for Moto2. Yeah, I mean, I think Acosta's going to clean up this year. He's an absolute animal. Um, and I'm sure that we'll see him in MotoGP next year or or as soon as possible anyway. Uh, Moto3 is a bit of a tricky one, eh? I mean, it's a lottery anyway. Like, come on, you know, you watch one Moto3 race and you almost have to tear your brain out because you don't know what's going on. Um, I don't know. I really like Ayumu Sasaki for this year. Yeah. Um, I think he showed a lot of maturity last year in terms of the fact that, like, he was able to put really good rides together consecutively. Um, but I, my heart would say I really want to see Dennis Onchu win it. Okay. That, that's a. Uh... Old prediction, I would say. Yeah, um, I mean, Dennis is obviously, a, yeah, a chaotic character anyway. So <laughs> you put him on a motorcycle and you don't never know what he's going to do. But it would be cool to see him do it. I feel like he sorted himself out a little bit. Yeah. It was very chaotic, like 2020 and even 2021. But 2022, he was more calm and he still was aggressive, but in a more calculated way, I felt yeah. like. But um, my pick is Diogo Mujera. Yeah, I think Diogo is the the logical choice for sure. Um, I hope he can, you know, like take that next step up and start fighting for race wins. And I think he will. Like, there's no doubt in my mind that he's going to go and win a handful of races this year. Um, but yeah, I think Ayumu as well will give him a, a good run for his money, to be honest. Yeah. And uh, the only thing that concerns me a little bit with Diogo is uh, his team. I don't know if it's up for the task when you compare them to Red Bull KTM or, yeah. you know, um, Ayuma Sasaki for uh, Max Racing. They've been doing it for a long time. They know what they're doing. They have been successful. And MT Helmets, it's, I don't know actually who runs the team, but it's a yeah, new no team. So, I don't know if they have the right guys to race because what Remy said, uh, especially about Ayo, everybody knows what they have to do mm -hmm. and do their job and they're good at their job. They're yeah. not, no chaos. It's very organized. Yeah. So I don't, this would be my, let's say, concern. But from a rider's perspective, Diogo Mohera, he is absolutely incredible. The way. He uh, demolished everybody at the Christmas City at Rocker's Ranch. <laughs> uh, that was their life. It was incredible. Yeah. And he went to, uh, to Supermoto World Championship and won a race. Yeah, and that is so hard to do. So hard yeah. to do. Crazy. But um, yeah, to, uh, to the Q&A, there are mm -hmm. a lot of questions we already covered. Okay. So uh, is Simon as wonderful as he seems? Yeah, he is. I can say that with absolute confidence. He's a one of a kind bloke. He's absolutely brilliant, like in a crazy way, I'd say. Um, he's very, very sweet, very, very nice guy, very genuine. Um, like uh, I can say even for this year, like he um, 
you know, he he always said to me at the end of last season that he'd love to see me at tests. And I know that he even put a word in for me to be able to go to tests and all this sort of stuff. So he's a very, very genuine, very nice guy. Exactly what you see with him on Twitter, you know, like uh, I'm sure you've seen that he's doing this thing at the minute, raising money to, to send to, um, uh, what do you call them, like dog shelters. You know, like he's a very sweet, nice guy. And that that whole kind of aura you get from him is exactly what he's like. I love Simon for his interview he did with Pete Barra in Misano when the news got out that Remy uh, got sacked. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Interview. If you haven't heard it, it's on the uh, Bad Model GP podcast uh, Instagram page. I put it up there because I thought it was so brilliant because he was asking exactly the right questions and he uh, wasn't gonna let uh, Pete Byra get away with the political answers that yeah. like the PR answers. He was pressing him and uh, I really enjoyed it. First of all, because I think it's a brilliant piece of journalism. That's what a journalist is supposed to do. And second of all, uh, it felt good because uh, Remy was done dirty by KTM and obviously I have a personal relationship with him yeah. and I like him very much. So it felt good to get at least some kind of, uh, let's say, redemption. Um, and uh, one thing is, which is kind of annoying about the whole thing, is every time Simon gets to interview somebody, he has this microphone and when a bike flies by, you can't understand a thing. You get only this uh, big noise from the bike and uh, you you always have to wait until uh, until the bikes are passed and then you continue the interview, which is a little bit unfortunate. So I don't know if there's any technical solution to uh, like editing the bike sound out of it or if there's a microphone who just uh, doesn't record it in a way, I don't know. But this would be like a great thing if we could get uh, Simon all the time without any interruption. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that the the tech guys in, in the, that department know exactly what you're describing. Um, I think, unfortunately, though, it's just a problem when you've got GP bikes screaming at full volume, full throttle yeah. going past you every two seconds. So, yeah, it's, it is unfortunate, yeah. The worst experience I ever had was in Austria because um, I went to a couple of MotoGP races uh, over the, uh, over my life, uh, in my life. And uh, it was always like the, um, the, the grandstands where you don't have a roof. So the sound just kind of evaporates. No? Mm -hmm. And um, in Austria, I was on the main stage and the whole thing was vibrating when the bikes flew by and it was incredibly loud and my dumb ass forgot my earpieces. <laughs> Luckily, they had some at the concession stores uh, for free, but uh, it was so incredibly loud. And yeah. I didn't even think about it. And then the first bike flew by and I was like, fuck. Yeah, 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 it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, Sepang's another place that's bad for that. Yeah, so bring your... Bring your uh, earplugs it's uh, like the best thing you can do on a MotoGP uh, race <laughs> in formula one you get away without uh, earpieces because the cars aren't that loud but MotoGP is horrible yeah definitely yeah they're loud things <laughs> it's no joke <laughs> also the Moto3 bikes are much louder than you than you would think yeah it's crazy they're, they're such a small bike can be so loud uh, who's the rider you would go out uh, for a beer with on a non-race weekend? Uh, I think your classic is obviously Jack Miller, isn't it? Um, yeah, there's a few. I quite like to go for a beer with quite a few of them. Uh, I think maybe say Jack is the obvious choice, but I'd quite like to go for a beer with Franco Morbidelli, actually. I, th I think that could get fun, you know? So, yeah, I'd say Jack or Frankie. It's a good, I, I mean, like, as you said, Jack Miller's the obvious one, but Frankie, I believe he's a very nice and chill guy. I would take Paul because Paul is the sweetest guy I've ever met. He was so incredibly kind. And uh, I feel like away from the whole MotoGP stuff, he's a very, very nice guy to talk to. You yeah. can just have a very wonderful time with him, I feel. 
Yeah, no, he is. I mean, same as Aleish, like Paul and Aleish are two very genuine and very nice guys. Uh, back to MotoGP. Do you think Joan Mir will perform better than Paul did? Um, yes, but, well, I was going to say not that I think Joan is better than Paul. I do think Joan is better than Paul. Uh, but I think it will be an unfair comparison because Paul was there with a bike that was harder to deal with. Not saying that the Honda now isn't still hard to deal with. It is, of course, still a little bit of a, a tricky customer, but I do think this year the bike is slightly better. I mean, Paul has two podiums over two years with Honda. Yeah, the one uh, podium. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first one was in Misano, right? Yeah. And then it was like the Honda one too, which was the most unexpected thing yeah, ever. Right. Yeah, when was that the race the two Ducatis fell off? Yeah. Yeah. I actually went uh, to that race live. Ah, yeah? Ah, cool. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, Valle's last race, and because of that, me and my mom, we went down to Italy to watch the race live. And, uh, yeah, it was a wild, chaotic weekend. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I was really, really emotionally involved in the Moto2 race because Remy, after he crashed in uh, Austin, he was not necessarily behind, but the championship got way close. And then all of a sudden, Raul was leading and Raul yeah. was like, I was like, fuck. And then Raul crashed. I was like, yeah. yeah and that was a big crash as well. That was a scary one. Yeah. And uh, last last question is, uh, it's actually from a MotoGP esports rider. And you said cover esports uh, as well. Uh, who is your favorite esports writer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> You're obviously not going to tell me who it is first. Um, no. Uh, ooh, favorite one is tricky. Very tricky. They're all really nice guys when you meet them. Like, they are all really, really nice. Um, I think purely for uh, his... Also, he's a nice guy, but also what he's like on track, Piero Ricciuti. I think he's a really nice guy. But then there's also... Um, Mr. T, the Australian guy, is is a great guy as well, and good for another party. So it was uh, Jack Hammer who. Oh yes, me. Jack as well. Yeah, Jack. <laughs> me and him actually message sometimes. Jack's a very nice guy, young lad. I don't know how old Jack is. He must only be like nineteen now or something. I tell you I what, Jack is actually. I think Jack will win esports this year. Yeah. 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 I don't follow esports at all you should but... well I, not that you should like you can check it out if you want to but it is actually quite good fun i don't know if you play the video games or anything at all but when i was a child i played them for hours and hours but uh like after MotoGP gp 2019 i stopped playing it because i kind of grew out of it i bought the 2021 uh, game because in 2020 i didn't buy it at all I don't know why. And um, then I thought, okay, maybe I will get back with the new game, but it's not fun to me anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I played uh, MotoGP 13 until 19, like multiple seasons, winning every championship you could. And uh, it was it was a nice time back then, but now I'm, I'm too old to waste my time with <laughs> video games. Yeah, you know? I can appreciate that. Uh, it's not necessarily only MotoGP, but I don't play roughly any video games anymore. No? Yeah, no, I mean, to be fair, this year I picked it up a little bit again and started playing some Call of Duty again, but I mean, I don't haven't really played it in a long time, so. Yeah. During the pandemic, I bought Red Dead Redemption 2 mm -hmm. because uh, back when Red Dead Redemption 1 came out, a friend of mine uh, had it because his brother bought it and we uh, started playing it together and uh, it was it was super super fun but uh, and i was really addicted to the game <laughs> uh, also like uh, gta uh, when it came out back then but then i thought okay let's buy red dead redemption uh, 2 to kill some time during the pandemic when i can't do shit anyways but it it didn't it didn't catch me i don't know yeah. if it's a game or but multiple games don't catch me anymore so 
yeah, I mean, those games I'm not really that fussed either because you have to invest quite a lot of time in. What I did play uh, last year was a Sniper Ghost Warrior Contracts 2. This was a good game. I liked it. Mm. Yeah, I never played it, so but I've seen some clips. It looks good. Yeah, but uh, we are now uh, two hours and almost 15 minutes in. So uh, thank you very much for all of your insight knowledge and uh, taking the time to uh, talk about MotoGP. And um, I would like to do it again some kind, sometime in the future. I had some fun and a lot of interesting stuff that I didn't know about. I learned a lot. So thank you very much. And I wish you all the best for the 23 season. Thank you. No, thank you for having me on. It's been uh, good fun having a chat. It's always nice to talk about bikes, obviously. Do it for a living anyway, but it's good to have a little chat. Um, no, and I look forward to the memes this year. Don't be too harsh on Dorno. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> no, good. No, cheers, mate. Bye.